Let's examine the set of forces between a shaft and a bearing system and consider some implications. So first we're looking at uh, rotational bearings. I have here a few examples just to sort of ground this. Here's a ball bearing, a bushing, and a shoulder screw. But this is less about the parts and more about the kind of uh, force and, uh, and position relationships that we see. So let's just consider first the, uh, the shaft and consider that we are supporting it with a pair of bearings. And I'm going to use this kind of typical symbol here with a box with an X through it to represent a bearing that has a, a sort of two, two sides, an inner side and an outer side. It could be a ball bearing or bushing. It doesn't really matter for this discussion. So let's consider for this purpose that the bearings are grounded. So the bearings are the outer race or the outer surface is fixed to some structure that's embedded in the world. And then the inner part is on a shaft that can support loads and also rotate. Now, in mechanical engineering terms, a bearing is a very general idea. It's a set of surfaces that constrain motion and uh, define or usually reduce friction. So, I mean, a glass sliding across the table has, in some sense, a transient bearing formed by the bottom of the glass on the table that constrains it to planar motion with three degrees of freedom and possibly, you know, some glass on wood friction. Um, not a, exactly a package bearing or necessarily a high quality bearing, but that is at least transiently a bearing surface. So normally we're thinking more in terms of engineering components like these ball bearings and bushings, um, which have better defined properties and create like well-defined joints that are then stable. So in this case, we have a rotational freedom, a single rotational freedom that defines one axis of rotation. And in principle, then the other five components of motion need to be considered. And those would correspond to um, three components of force that need to be resisted and, and two additional components of moment that need to be resisted. Presumably the moment around the axis of the, of the, of the shaft, which causes it to rotate, is uh, minimal, minimized by having a low friction bearing, and we don't really need to think about that. But of course, the symmetries mean that we can actually reduce this down typically to just considering two forces in one moment, and now we can diagram those out. So let's think about the sort of overall load on the shaft, which would be perhaps the load of a moving part that's being supported by the system. So let's define a radial component, which is, uh, in the in the plane of the or in a plane parallel to the plane of the bearings or perpendicular to the shaft axis, and then let's also think about an axial component. And wherever we apply it, we're just going to draw it as along the axis of the bearing. And in some sense, these are straightforward. the The radial force on the shaft is going to is going to translate to radial loads on the bearings, a direction it usually supports quite well. And the axial force of the load on the end of the shaft will translate to axial loads on the bearings. Um, which, depending on the bearing, they either support well or not, but at least it's a kind of known axis, and the symmetries mean that um, the, the, the form uh, carries that well enough up to the capacity of the bearing. But let's consider the moment. Um, it's possible to create a moment on the shaft, which we're going to draw by this little couple with an M, and that would re reflect some kind of twisting of, uh, on the shaft. And again, there's two freedoms this could be, but the symmetry of the rotational symmetry of the system means we only need to think about one of them and the other one would be the same. So let's, let's sort of re-diagram this now and think about how that moment translates into bearing forces. So I'm going to draw the shaft again here. And just for a moment, consider we have uh, just point contacts on the shaft that uh, are only a single point contacts and thus could only support a radial load. And then we'll see that that actually ends up being the right analysis. So if I have a moment on the shaft, an overall moment M, uh, that, would, that could be resisted by a, a, a symmetric set of forces uh, which would be in the radial direction here and here at our point contacts. And we can see that the couples, there's, you know, one, the, the moment here is exerting a clockwise couple on the shaft and the counter forces from the bearings here, these point contacts, are a counterclockwise couple from the other side. And these have some defined distance between them, which is just called, which we'll call D. Now, if this are, if these were bearings, we can do the, look at the free body analysis of the system and to see that the, the forces Fm and, uh, on top and bottom are symmetric and so have to be equal, and they're pointing in, opposite in, this, in the opposite directions on the same body, so they won't produce any net acceleration, they're in balance. So this actually ends up being a balanced, a balanced set of, of forces right here. That moment is, is um, from on the shaft, is supported by those two point contacts at the bearing locations. And we can look at what those would be equal to. The couple produced by the uh, point contact forces will simply be, a, it's a force times a distance, so simply as Fm times D, and that's going to be equal to our moment that we're applying. And then we can look at that and just move the D across to see that the radial forces caused by this moment will simply be M divided by the D. 
So more or less, that means we want to make sure that if we want to keep the forces to a minimum, we want to keep d as large as possible. And that's kind of the basic conclusion here, is that by, by using a pair of bearings separated, we increase that d dramatically, and that reduces the, ra the, uh, the radial loads that are produced by the moment. So in practice, these forces superimposed. If you have a combination of radial load and moment on a, a shaft, uh, the, the radial loads that the bearings will see will be the sum of that overall radial load plus the term that's due to the moment here, which is the m over d components. So that is, uh, and then the other the last point is, if there were, an, if I, said, I have assumed there was point contact from the bearings, and in some sense, the symmetry of it can show that any axial component would just be negligible, would, would, would be uh, uh, counterbalanced itself, right? If you had a, if, if at the bearing point, there was some axial component to this due to this force, it would be along the axis of the shaft, and it would not produce any net moment. So that's the argument that any axial forces, there can't be an axial force produced by the, by the moment, because uh, any axial force that would exist doesn't actually counteract any moment. Um, and in practice, that it means that, um, you know, up to the compliance of the, of the, of the parts, there, it doesn't, it's negligible, it doesn't exist. So that is the sort of basic layout for uh, explaining, sort of discussing why you want to have uh, the, the context that the radial forces that the bearings produce as widely separate as possible. Let's think about that kind of on a more microgeometric scale here. If I look, if I imagine I have a bushing here, I'm going to blow up my shaft considerably. I imagine I have a bushing, just a single bushing now, which is not recommended. Effectively, it has some finite width, right? The bushing might be, you know, a fraction of an inch wide, but it has some finite width. And there's always a little bit of flex in real parts. It's never a perfect fit. So what's going to end up happening is, if you have a moment on the shaft, there's going to be some contact point that makes contact kind of at each corner. And the D will end up just being the width of the bearing more or less, it's not well determined. And that means that the, the magnification of forces will be quite high, as well as the fact that there's mechanical tolerance, there's a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, wiggle because the, um, it's not a completely tight fit, there'll be significant angular deviation as well. So for both those reasons, it's never recommended to support a shaft on a single short bushing. You use a very long bushing so you have extended contact over a wide area, or use a pair of smaller bushings with some significant distance between them in order to get a reasonable uh, coupling between that moment on the shaft and the, uh, the radial forces of the bearing. Now let's also look a little bit at how this might get uh, evolved into practice. So if we have now a, a shaft and we uh, have our set of, of bearings on it, um, now typically we, we, do, we form what's called a clevis. These bearings are somehow coupled uh, in a rigid structure to the other to the other side. And this might be an entire structure or a single cast part or a piece of U-channel or any number of things. Um, that means that the two bearings are held in uh, alignment and they're, they both have uh, support to a common structure that don't move relative to each other. And they're, then they can nicely support the, the forces and moments from the shaft and couple that into the other structure. The most common case of this, honestly, is a door hinge. The, the, the sort of four is basically two interleaved clevises uh, that combine on the single shaft of the of the door hinge to provide a nice uh, single degree freedom that has a very good torque coupling. And then also there's two hinges on the door to provide a very wide D value so that the, the, the static load of the door, which creates a significant moment on the hinge axis, is supported by the top hinge and bottom hinge at quite separated distances to get a lot of a lot of uh, good moment transfer from the door weight into the door frame. Now, this kind of clever structure uh, is only one way to do it because the other like obviously the issue here is basically this kind of implies that you're applying your major uh, loads to the center of the shaft here. If you have some other center part that's that's pivoting, and the major issue there is of course it can self collide. If you're building a door hinge, it only has limited travel; it doesn't have to go within itself, and so that's fine. And for like robots that have uh, knee joints or elbow joints or various kinds of connections in a serial chain, that's often true. There's a, a finite joint travel. And so having um, the kind of knee structure where there's the outer clevis around some inner rotating part is perfectly fine. But it does mean that there tends to be a self-collision right in the middle, and that sometimes is a problem. So another way that these are often structured is using a cantilever arrangement. If I have my shaft and I place the bearings separated, but then I significantly extend the shaft out beyond them, then the load can be out, outside, out beyond the shaft. And this is this is also commonly seen in 
structures uh, where you have to have full rotation. Um, in some sense, even like your fan, like your electric fan has a structure kind of like this. The fan blades are on the end of a shaft, and that shaft is supported typically in a fairly long bushing or a pair of bearings. Um, and then the kind of combination of axial and radial loads and moments out here um, all can couple to some separation on the bearings and ideally try to keep that um, kind of as high as reasonably possible. Now, one thing to note is in this case, because I don't, I no longer have the symmetry of applying my radial load right between the bearings, a, a radial, a, a radial force out here produces a strong radial force on the, you know, an equal radial force on the bearings, but also creates quite a significant moment. The longer the shaft is, the more that moment is. So having a very long shaft, the axial loads um, are the symmetry means that the shaft can be as long as sort of within reason as long as needed and the axial loads still coupled to an axial load, but the that the, the moments produced by that radial load increase with the distance beyond the bearings. So this is just a set of trade-offs. If you're going to have a significant mass out here um, that's, that's kind of pivoting on something, um, at some point you have to start to consider the fact that you're bending your shaft and the moments are starting to increase as that moves away from the bearing pair. And you, you either need to compensate by figuring out how to use a, a larger diameter shaft or, or you know, separate the bearings even more back in this area, or bring the whole mass closer. There's a whole set of design trade-offs regarding that, but still, the idea of having a cantilever joint gives you freedom because now the plane of rotation um, around that that moment that mass uh, is no longer going to collide with the structure that's supporting the bearings. You have full rotation, and you can build a, a more free uh, kind of movement out there. So the net take on this really is it's a strong argument that you should always use bearings in pairs. Uh, two pairs will still two bearings will still uniquely define an axis. They will provide a strong coupling from the moments on the shaft back to the structure. And um, by there are some constraints. They have to maintain alignment, so they need to be considered how they're going to be placed on a common structure so that the axis remains collinear with the axis of, uh, that you want for the shaft. Um, but you, by using them in pairs, you, you uh, create a, a, a tight structure that has le less uh, mechanical slop as well as a strong sort of force coupling to ground.